Bassick, the only cool guy at 105.3 The Fan. He'll join us in moments. Former Major League pitcher, but he knows all about the Dallas Cowboys as we get into this game. And one thing I want people to chew on here, Jessica, where are we going here? Man, where are we going? Where do you want to go here? And, you know, we can talk about breaking records or whatnot, but we, talk, we have the Cowboys on deck. But there is something happening with Nick Bosa, and I think some fans kind of come, come across my Twitter timeline and some people will text me about it. Is it a big deal that Bosa only has one sack on a season? Does that bother everybody? Does that bother anybody? Because I see a guy who has been dominant. Now, the sack numbers might not be there. And you may say, well, Michael Parsons is and T.J. Watts is. Bosa's put pressure on the quarterback, but Bosa only having one sack through the first four games. How are people feeling about that? 888-957-9570. I want people to think about that and call in. You know, it's an interesting conversation because there's the whole like nuance of defensive line and offensive line play that we don't necessarily understand as casual fans. Right. But then there's also the reality that is like, you know, this is one of his drier spells of his career of not recording sacks. Doesn't mean he's not good. Doesn't mean that guys aren't scheming against him. His double team, you know what? The double team rate and everything we'll get like into that. All that stuff because he's got thirty three percent double team rate, which right. is the highest in the NFL. Now, Michael Parsons is four percent less than Nick Bosa. Michael Parsons has four sacks. Yes, so there's not a big drop off there. But let's get to Mike Bassick. Mike Bassick, one hundred five three. The fan, the only cool guy over there. R.J. Sean and Bobby Fouché, They don't want to do the crossover this year, so we'll talk to Mike. We always love talking to Mike. Man, he's a big time Mavericks fan. Of course, major league pitcher, a uh, former major league pitcher. He is a little famous for the wrong reasons. But Mike, good morning, man. Long time no talk. Texas Rangers rolling, and now we got Cowboys and Niners. How you doing, my man? Man, we're doing good here. It's a unbelievable weekend as you have arguably the biggest rivalry uh, in the NFL. And I know you guys have owned it the last few years, but then you have one of the biggest college rivalries uh, here at 11 a.m. Right. Texas OU That's right. uh, in downtown Dallas, pretty much. And then the Rangers made it to the uh, divisional round. So we're living well here. No, that's right. Oh, Oklahoma, geez. Texas. Te- Texas, seven-point favorites mm-hmm. over Oklahoma. Final Big 12 game. Uh, yeah. for, uh, matchup between yeah, the two between of the them. Two. Will, they do, will they still do the Red River shootout when, once they move to the SEC? Yes, uh, 100%. It's just that UT has to kind of uh, figure out, because the A&M rivalry is obviously huge, and they used to play either yep. the night of Thanksgiving or the night after Thanksgiving. So right. they just probably want to make sure that that OU game stays in October and the A&M game goes in late November. So those are kind of spread out. Yeah, that, that is big for Texas. You get A&M back on the schedule. You continue the rivalry with Oklahoma, probably be in the SEC West with Alabama. We'll see how that shakes out here. Of course, we got to get a Bochy question in at some point, but Cowboys – Niners. It feels like this game is a lot more important for Dallas for some sort of mental hurdle to get over the 49ers. Do you agree with that, Mike? 100%. Uh, The other thing, too, is not only that, I'll take it to this real quick, is that Philadelphia or Dallas is not going to win their division, which means you'd have to go on the road for three playoff games to try to make the Super Bowl. And for me personally, uh, the Cowboys can't do that. There's just no way you can go through Winning on the road, maybe an easier game. Let's just say it's that South Divisional winner, like last year, which was Tampa Bay. But then, if you were to beat San Francisco or Philadelphia, that's going to be a physical battle. And then you'd have to do it again on the road the next week against Philadelphia or San Francisco. I just think that's too tough to do. And maybe I'm not giving... Maybe it's Detroit or somebody else enough credit to really make it to an NFC championship game. But I do think it's a three-team battle uh, in the NFC, San Francisco, Philadelphia, and Dallas, and in probably in that order right now uh, in my mind. And Dallas does have the mental hurdle of can we beat this team? Because going back, Garoppolo played like trash in the uh, <laughs> divisional game. But it didn't matter, right, because Dak didn't play better. Uh, so – you still won. And then last year, Purdy played okay, but the Cowboys' offense didn't play better. And so I look at it uh, this Sunday night, and I go, look, at some point, Dak, who I'm uninspired by, I get he's a good NFL quarterback, but he doesn't inspire me anymore. Can you inspire me by going to San Francisco on the road and putting up 24 to 27 points? Because if you can do that, I think you can beat San Francisco. Whoever gets to 20 probably has a great chance of winning this game. So I mean, I want to dig on that for a second, like 
because I do feel like the national narrative is, is an interesting one. We're in our bubble, like the Niner bubble, and right. we got Brock Purdy mania, and I look at Dak kind of side-eyed. I mean, I think he's, a, like you said, a good player, but like 40 million bucks? I mean, geez, Louise. How are you guys doing Brock Purdy? Like, would, would Dallas fans sign up for Brock Purdy right now? Obviously, there's a financial component to this, but uh, or do they view him with a side-eye? So, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I view Brock Purdy as having that edge to him i'm not sure how great he is but i also didn't know how great tom brady was in 2001 2002 it's like he's solid but they obviously have an awesome defense they have bill belichick and tom brady's doing exactly what is being asked of him and they're winning games and obviously they won a championship pretty quickly with tom brady and i look at brock purdy the same way i'm like i don't know how great he is but he seems to know how to win, and he seems to have that edge about him, and he's a young guy who can improve throughout this season. So uh, I'm interested in Brock Purdy. To me, he has that kind of special trait, and maybe four years from now I look at him and I go, hey, that special trait didn't work out, and he's just an average quarterback in the NFL. Or that special trait works out, and you're like, damn. Is he the next Joe Montana? Because Joe Montana, third-round pick, I get how good he was at Notre Dame. That's a little before my time. But that's the thing about Brock Purdy is he seems to have that kind of edge to him, that, that kind of like, I'll figure out a way how to win this game in the end. So that's the way I look at him. I don't look at him as like a special like talent, but I look at him as all those extra traits that you need to have to be a champion. He might have that. Mike, who's more important, in your opinion, or more valuable to the 49ers offense? Is it Christian McCaffrey or is it Brock Purdy? That's a great question. You'd always lean towards the quarterback because they have so much say uh, in the game. But I think the 49ers have done a tremendous job at building a team around him that you can take the pressure off of him. Because if you put Brock Purdy, this is where it's out. If you put Brock Purdy on the Kansas City Chiefs, I don't know if they win 10 games and nothing against Brock Purdy, but you look at what Kansas city has as weapons. They don't have great receivers. They have obviously a great tight end. They don't have great running backs, but they have Patrick Mahomes and he can carry a team. He can bail the offensive line out of situations. He can bail having average wide receivers at best out of situations. But Christian McCaffrey can take so much pressure off of Brock Purdy, because if you're in second and four, if you feel like you can still hand the ball, off in certain situations or just throw a screen pass just get the ball out get McCaffrey in space and he can make the play the other day that run he had against Arizona amazing Um, so I look at Brock Purdy's more important but Christian McCaffrey can take a lot of pressure off the young man watching game in game out play in play out for multiple seasons what what is it that makes Parsons so special from your eye he has an unbelievable motor he's super fast He's way stronger than he looks, as in when you're watching him go against an offensive lineman at 320 pounds and he's 250-something pounds, you wouldn't know any better. You would think that he's stronger than the 320-pound guy. And the other thing, too, is he just keeps pursuing. So if he flushes Brock Purdy out of the pocket and you think, oh, Brock Purdy took off the way that Micah Parsons came, he didn't get him. He'll just stop on a dime and then start sprinting and then putting pressure on Purdy to get the ball out in another two or three seconds because he has uh, Micah still on his back. So for me, I've, I'll put it this way. My father's 72 years old and He saw Randy White. He saw Bob Lilly, obviously DeMarcus Ware recently. And he's like, to me, I'm Michael to him. He's Mike. And he's like, Michael, I've seen them all for Dallas. I don't think I've seen a better defensive player in Cowboys history. Mike Bassick, 105.3 The Fan in Dallas, doing a great job. Former Major League uh, pitcher. Of course, the playoffs are happening right now. We'll squeeze in a Bochy question in a second here. But, you know, the catch is a seminal moment for 49er fans in this rivalry. That is the one that spurred the rivalry or spurred their dynasty uh in the 80s what is the equivalent for cowboy fans in this rivalry is it alvin harper on a quick slant in the 92 nfc championship game is it ms smith running up in the end zone over and over and over again what is the equivalent for cowboy fans mike it's probably the alvin harper play because i think i'm not 100 percent sure i think the 49ers were favored by seven points in the mm-hmm. 92 nfc championship game and it was like dude these cowboys 
they're going to be something special. But they're probably not going to go to San Francisco on a muddy field with Steve Young, with Jerry Rice, with everything they still have. They know how to win championships. They know how to win this NFC championship game at home. It's probably one year too soon to pick the Cowboys. And the Cowboys did something that probably most people going into that game thought they couldn't do. And maybe in... 81, if I have my year right. I was born in 77. So I know all the highlights. I've seen right. all of it. I've seen the, the tackle of Drew Pearson after the catch. But uh, whoever it was for San Francisco doesn't drag down Drew Pearson. That then Danny White leads the team back down the field, and mm-hmm. San Francisco's the catch doesn't become the catch. But they had a huge tackle on mm-hmm. Pearson uh, late in that game. So the same way that the Cowboys had owned the 70s uh, and then San Francisco owned the 80s and then for the most part obviously the early to mid 90s Dallas owned because they somewhat took it away from San Francisco yeah I'm surprised you didn't say Mike didn't say uh, Shasky the 71 onside kick <laughs> when the your game, dad left my the game dad early. left early yeah. oh my god <laughs> My dad still talks about that. It's the only game he ever, he's like, I don't know, 14 or 15 years old. And he took the Muni home in the end of the third quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter, thinking that the game was a wrap and that the Cowboys scored two touchdowns late with like two minutes to go with an onside kick and a guy fumbled. And yeah, the rest is history. That's why we don't leave games early, Mike. Just like you, it's a generational thing over here. Uh, let me get it, squeeze in a Bochi question. I'm watching these playoffs. It's been outstanding. I mean, just the electricity, the changes they've made to the game as a whole have been just awesome. I want to see, as a Giants fan, I want to see Dusty versus Bochi in the next round. Like, that's what I want to see. How great has Bochi been seeing him day in, day out? It's pretty much the same as last year. Now I get Josh Young has been way better. If you're not following the Rangers, he's the rookie third baseman. Oh, and then Evan Carter baller. is the phenom who is a top 10 prospect in all baseball who mm-hmm. got called up in mid-September mm-hmm. and has just taken off. But I think Bochy gives those guys, you guys will know this better than I do, following him in San Francisco for his Hall of Fame managerial career. But it seems like... You call up a young guy, and he gives that guy confidence. That guy doesn't seem like, oh, gosh, this moment's too big. And, look, one, you have to give credit to the player. But, two, you do have to give credit to the manager who has made that guy feel like he belongs and that he's the right guy for the moment. And last year, with a similar team, they almost lost 100 games. I get the pitching's way better this year. But I do think Bochi brings um, – this confidence and this also I'm going to do it for the team. I I feel like this Texas Ranger team, which is very tough to do in all sports is to get professional athletes who are trying to make a great living and try to set up their family for life and their, you know, their extended family for life that he gets guys to sacrifice for the team. And that is so tough to do in professional sports, man, that that team, we watch a lot. Well, I play fantasy baseball. So Josh Young was my third baseman. My team took a nosedive when he did get hurt this season, but Texas looks good. That looked really good. Real quick, before we get you out of here, Mike, and we appreciate the time as always, Trey Lance. What's it like what happened Trey Lance down there? Does anybody talk about him down there? I know he's a third-string quarterback. Maybe he's in the news this week playing his forward team, you know, giving Jerry Jones and Mike McCarthy inside of the 49ers playbook. What's that been like having Trey down there in Dallas? We, we, after getting him, there was this a lot of talk about getting him, like, oh, this is interesting, third overall pick. We haven't talked too much about him except in this way. The Cowboys have really struggled in the red zone, and maybe not just red zone, but inside the 10-yard line. And so the only talk we've had about Trey Lance is, if you keep struggling, now the Cowboys in a weird way have had three out of their four games being a blowout and then just losing to one of the worst teams in the NFL, is... If you were to keep struggling through week six or week seven, would the Cowboys activate Trey Lance and put in red zone packages like, you know, run pass type of options for him? So it's kind of one of these things where we just know Jerry, he's going to pay a crap load of money to probably Dak Prescott in the offseason to extend him to make sure that he beats an eight or nine win team uh, here. But it's interesting because you just don't. Uh oh. So, you know, they, they close practice off. So I would love to know how he's doing because he's a very athletic, you know, quarterback, but you just don't get to see what he's doing in practice. And we're not hearing anything from the players or the coaching staff that, man, Trey Lance is doing some things in practice that are really impressing us. So we just haven't heard kind of those behind the scenes stuff on Trey Lance that he's doing anything that maybe. 
he'd get elevated to backup quarterback. Or maybe they would think about putting packages in to activate him to be the quarterback kind of inside the 10-yard line. Boy, Trey Lance inside the red zone ought to be an interesting wrinkle this Sunday if that does happen because we know Dallas is 30th when it comes to red zone efficiency, as you just said. Mike, thanks for the time. As always, enjoy the playoffs. A big weekend in Dallas. Huge. Red yeah, River thanks shootout. for having me, man. Uh, yeah, anytime. Anytime, Mike. You're the best. Mike Bassick, 105.3 The Fan in Dallas there.